Father, we thank you. We glorify your holy name. We worship you. We adore you, Lord. Father, we say glory, honor, adoration be to your holy name in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for giving us opportunity to be at your feet to learn daily. Father, Lord, we are learning daily. We are understanding the scriptures. Yes, you have given us the opportunity to start picking little by little from the beginning to the end. Thereby, the Spirit of God put into remembrance in our lives. Thank you, Lord, Father. Our hearts and minds are open to continue to hear from you. We hear your word daily and we are metamorphosed. We grow thereby. Thank you, Father, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. We are continuing from where we stopped in the last video. In the last video, we were dealing with the book of Samuel, and we briefly went through 1 Samuel. Amen. Now, we are going into 2 Samuel, but don't forget, we are doing brief exposition of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And now we are in Samuel. So in this video, we'll be dealing with 2 Samuel. And remember the topic of this very series from this very moment from 1 Samuel to 2 Chronicle is the rise and fall of the monarchy. So this is the part two of it. And this is dealing with 2 Samuel. Now, the second book of Samuel talks about David's triumph. That is in chapter 1 to chapter 12. First, as the king of Judah, he was constituted in, at Hebron and he ruled for seven years. Then later, as the king of all Israel, and here he was constituted at Jerusalem. And this he became after 13 years of his ordination. From the moment that someone ordained him up to this very moment, that's when he became the full king of the whole Israel. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, of course... Devil's troubles. Well, from chapter 1 to chapter 12, talks about David's triumphs. Chapter 13 to 24 talks about David's troubles in his family and in the nation. I say, oh. Now, let's talk about the Davidic, the Davidic covenant. Remember, when we started, we said there are three covenants that God made with Israel. One with Abraham, two with the nation Israel, and three with David. The first was an unconditional covenant that God made with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. The second one is conditional covenant that God made with the children of Israel in the wilderness. And this is the third covenant, the unconditional, unconditional covenant that God made with David. The third covenant of God, which was to David, that affected all the following. This covenant affected everything in terms of the scripture, the history of mankind. This dealt with the perpetuity of the Davidic dynasty. That is the continuation, the confirmation of the Davidic dynasty forever. The Davidic covenant is unconditional. It is the divine confirmation of God's eternal throne in Israel. And it, is, it also have a messianic implication. Let's look at 2 Samuel from chapter 7, verse 11. It says, 
and has since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused thee to rest from all thy enemies, also the Lord tell thee that he will make thee a house. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee. This is the covenant of God to David, given to him by the prophet, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. This is a clear issue concerning although the covenant is forever, if you commit errors, it can be beaten. It can be dealt with. Remember, the Bible says, him that God loves, he shall stand. He is saying here that he will shall stand his own with the rod of men. Sometimes they can be defeated sometimes, but they can never be thwarted forever. But my mercy shall not depart away from him. As I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these things, according to all these words, and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. This is the word of the Lord from prophet Nathan to David, that this is the covenant that God has prepared and planned for him. The Davidic covenant is unconditional. It is the divine confirmation of God's eternal throne in Israel. This shows that God has set his throne is in Israel forever. This shows that yes, God is living, is going to live on this earth, on his throne in Jerusalem forever. And this also has messianic implications, a perpetual confirmation throughout the Bible. The messianic implication has a perpetual confirmation throughout the Bible. In the book of Psalms, and in the book of Acts, as example. Let's look at the book of Psalms. Psalms 89, verse 29, and also verse 35 to 37. It says, He said, Also will I make to endure forever, and his throne has the days of heaven. Once have I sworn, by my holiness, that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon, and has a faithful witness in heaven. Silla. It shall be established forever. Let's also look at um, the book of Acts, chapter 2, from verse 29. It says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Peter is trying to explain the messianic implications of the Davidic covenant, which is unconditional and is forever. 
Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he will raise up Christ to sit on his throne. One, the throne, there is a confirmation of the throne forever in Israel, in Jerusalem. And there is a confirmation that Christ will sit on the throne. Christ is the full embodiment of the Godhead. The completeness of God. So God will sit on the throne in Christ. He, seeing this before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, where all we all are witnesses. Praise the name of the Lord. You see, so the Davidic covenant is unconditional. It is the divine confirmation of God's eternal throne in Israel. And the Messianic implication talks about by sons of David and sons of Abraham. You can see that in Matthew 1. 1. And the lion of the tribe of Judah, root of David, can be seen in Revelation 5 verse 5. These are the Messianic implications. We saw them in Psalm, we saw it in Acts, it is also in Matthew, and it's in Revelation, and it's in many other verses of the scripture. Now, let's talk about the zenith, that is the David's prowess, the height of David's prowess. He was a victorious warrior and a clever general who subdues the Philistines to the west, which was Saul's nemesis. Remember that they were problems to Saul. They were nemesis. They were problems to Saul. Saul could not subdue them. But David subdued them in the West. Then the Syrian and the Hadadezer in the North. The Ammonites and the Moabites on the East. The Edomites and the Amalekites in the south. These are the people that David subdued. He was also a constructive administrator. He brought judgment and justice to all the people. He did wonderfully where he was. He, has, he was filled with wisdom. He organized the priesthood into 24 courses. Remember, Samuel founded the, um, the school of the prophets. But David now organized this priesthood system to 12 courses in terms of sacrifice. Then each course takes one full week from Sabbath to Sabbath. Then another course takes over. And that became a wonderful system of sacrifice of the priesthood. He was a major poet and a songwriter. Of course, we know about the books of uh, Psalms. Although he didn't write everything, but he wrote major, all the major parts of the book of uh, Psalms. Now, David's turning point, it was culminating of a process which was due to ease in prosperity, leading to self-indulgence like accumulating wives forbidden in the scripture in Deuteronomy 17.17. 17. Just like all human, just like Saul, David became very prospective, prosperous, good success, doing wonderfully well. And of course, self-indulgence came in. He started getting married. And in Deuteronomy 17:17, 17, 17, the Bible recorded that yes, one of the law is you should not have multiple wives. It's there that there should be not be multiple wives. But David started getting married. And that is a self-indulgence that can always cause little severe problems. His great sin, which was adultery and then murder. We know the story of David and Bathsheba. Not that David saw Bathsheba just once. 
he has been seeing that because he's close by. And then, like we said, it's a culmination of a process. He started igniting the negativities within him. The spirit of adultery. And before you know it, he took Bathsheba. And after doing that, he didn't stop there. Knowing fully well that Bathsheba is pregnant, if the husband comes back home, it becomes a problem. He now sent the husband to the middle where he knows that yes, the husband will not be able to come back. And the husband was killed. So it was intentional that the husband be killed. The husband of Bathsheba. So that is why it said his gracing was adultery and murder. The difference between David and Saul is this. David loved the Lord. David's remorse and repentance. If you read Psalm 51, you will see David has a very serious... He loved the Lord, so he gave his heart and he was remorseful. He repented of his actions because he has deep remorse and he repented of his actions. He is regarded by God as a man after God's own heart. This can be seen in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14 and Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 13, verse 22. Now, the Bible recorded something that whatsoever you sow, you reap. Even if you are forgiven, I can assure you, you still reap. You still reap. This led to years of suffering. That act led to years of suffering. The remorse and contrition did not obliterate the consequence of sin. There is consequence of sin. Consequence of sin doesn't mean that you are not forgiving. But sometimes, according to the law of life, there is consequence of sin. Whatsoever you sow, you reap. If you sow to the flesh, you reap out of the flesh. Corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you reap out of the spirit life and peace. Is this. It led to incest in the life of the family of David. Fraticides, games and intrigues, rebellion and civil war. Because of his stained hands, because his hand was stained, he was not allowed to build the temple. Although he prepared most of the expenses. If you read the Bible, you see David prepared most of the expenses for the building of the temple. But the Bible says because his son was filled with blood, he wasn't allowed to. And also there was trouble in the family. First of all, the first son of Bathsheba died. Amnon, Amnon raped David's daughter Tamar. Of course, Absalom killed Amnon. Then, Absalom led a rebellion against David based on counsel of Ahitophel. Based on counsel of Ahitophel. Led a rebellion against David. Adonijah seized the kingship from Solomon. All is the prerequisite of not doing the right thing at the right time. This will lead us to the book of First King and later Second King. This is what happened. You need to understand. That although you are forgiven your sins, sometimes the effect, the consequence of sins remains. A man that sleeps with a woman, sometimes before you know it, the consequence will be pregnancy, AIDS, 
diseases, that those consequences can be there, even if the man has been forgiven. Even if the woman has been forgiven, that wouldn't change the result. In the realm of the spirit, it's the same. Sometimes things happen that things doesn't go well. It will have been because, or it will have because the, these are the consequences of what has been done before. Even when the person has been forgiven and everything is gone. So the idea that, yes, I've prayed, I've repented, and God has forgiven me, then that will not bear the consequences. No. We need to understand the difference between forgiveness and bearing these consequences of your actions. A man that kills can be forgiven doesn't mean that the consequence of killing will not be it. It can be forgiven by God. Everything is washed out for. But the consequences can still be that goes to prison and or sometimes is killed. So please, wash out and wash what you do because there are consequences for every action that we do, even when we are forgiven. Now we'll be going to the next video, which we'll be talking about Kings, the book of Kings, First Kings and Second Kings. Oh Father, we thank you, we glorify your holy name. We worship you, we adore you, we say thank you, thank you, Lord Father. We receive your word daily and we'll continue to receive your word. We know that it's not by power, it's not by mind, but by the Holy Spirit. As we preach the gospel, as we teach the word of God, we are energized and enhanced. As we receive these words also, we are built up daily. Thank you, Lord Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.